Hi, welcome everybody. It's been a while since I've seen you. Welcome back to another DMB Facebook Live. Um, this is a fun one. We're gonna be talking about a whole bunch of projects all at one time with a fantastic guest who is kind of one of the main Soundscape users here for installations here in the US. Um, but real quick, I just wanted to tell you guys, um, this is going to be uh, recorded and available to watch later on Facebook and YouTube. So if you miss a part of it or you wanna hear some of the audio samples, be sure to check it out later. Um, also, as I mentioned, there's gonna be some audio samples, so get your headphones ready. Uh, nothing uh, audio file quality, but some fun stuff to listen to. Um, so be sure to have that ready. And please ask questions, make comments. Uh, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, uh, the more questions you have, the more you give us to talk about and the more that we can make sure that you get the information you need. So um, quick intro here. I just wanna make sure everybody knows that we also have tutorial videos available online at dbaudio.com as well as on our YouTube channel. So be sure to subscribe to that. And if you have any questions that come up while watching this later, or you want more of a private kind of um, you know, consultation about Soundscape or anything else in the DMB universe, please email support at dbaudio.com. Uh, do us a favor and tell us what country you're in so that that can get transferred to a support person in your region that speaks your language and in your time zone. Uh, but this is the email for all DMB support all the time, especially Soundscape questions. And if you want some more details about Soundscape, we have first two videos of a new video series about Soundscape and the DS100 available at YouTube. The first two videos are about the DS100 hardware processor and its functionality as a system matrix mixer. And the second video talks about and scene and object-based mixing. Uh, so be sure to check those out on YouTube afterwards. So next thing I wanna do here is introduce our guest. Um, like I said, he's kind of one of our main people when it comes to Soundscape here in the US. He was an early pioneer with some initial projects. Uh, he has some very creative solutions and creative applications for Soundscape. Uh, his name is Kevin Sweetser. He's an old friend of mine. We go way back in the Bay Area where we've worked a lot of different types of gigs together. Um, but he also gets around. This guy is all over the country doing all kinds of stuff with this fancy pink blazer. Um, you know, just kind of a couple examples of places where he's working at now. Um, the Voxel Theater, which is uh, kind of the side project or pet project of our friends at Figure 53 who make QLab software. Um, Sun Valley Music Festival, which is a brand new soundscape project that we're gonna talk about a fair amount today. Um, and we go way back at Stanford University where we have some soundscape projects and Woolly Mammoth Theater. He, this guy, he's all over the place. So let me just put it to you in perspective here. Uh, these are all projects that Kevin's been involved with using Soundscape across the country. Dinkelspiel Auditorium, which not only has one, but two Soundscape systems in the same room, one run by a sound engineer for the sake of the audience, the other one on a touchscreen panel that works as a virtual orchestra shell for the sake of the orchestra on stage. Uh, also, he was one of the people on the crew helping us out with doing N Space for the San Francisco Symphony at Frost Amphitheater. Uh, so 8,000 people with some emulated room acoustics. More on that in a minute. He's also the technical director at The Voxel there in Baltimore. Uh, where he spends some of his time. We'll figure out where in the country he is today. But uh, Voxel, as I mentioned, uh, managed by Figure 53, uh, kind of a pet project. So this place is an event space. It's a sandbox for QLab stuff um, and, and, and just kind of an all around community service theater there in Baltimore. And the brand new project I mentioned, Sun Valley, Idaho, a beautiful resort town out in the country um, with a large outdoor, um, you know, lawn area where people can come and watch the Sun Valley Symphony and hear them now with Soundscape using object-based mixing and emulated rim acoustics. So without further ado, let's go ahead and bring Kevin in here and say hi. Hey, how's it going? Hi, buddy. How are you? I'm doing good. Um, as into where I am in the world, I'm actually in Sun Valley right now um, in our one of our gracious hosts apartments um getting ready to gear up for our, our season for the first time in two years we're gonna have live audience 
I know. With the soundscape, nonetheless. Yeah. New and yeah. improved and back to business. Yeah, it's going to be exciting. So Sun Valley, Idaho, for anybody that doesn't know, this is a, a destination town for tourists. Uh, a lot of great mm -hmm. skiing in the winter. In the summer, we have this beautiful amphitheater outdoors with the symphony, uh, kind of a destination for the rich and famous sometimes, but an otherwise small kind of Western U.S. town, right? Yeah, it was really big in the 50s. A bunch of movie stars made it their destination place, and it's kind of stuck. It's gotten, you know, kept its little honed small vibe, but still a lot of people come here and not many people know about it somewhat sometimes, but it's it's a fun place to be for you know a few weeks, hang out in the yeah. mountains. We had a good time there a couple of weeks ago, commissioning this new system. You took me to a, a yeah. natural hot spring. That was kind of fun. Yeah, we've got hot springs, we've got rivers. We usually go whitewater rafting. It's, kind of, it's, I mean, on your off days when you go whitewater rafting, that's a pretty that's a pretty good time. Yeah, I got to come back. Yeah. Um, so hey, yeah, before I mean, we started, re real quick, I just want to—I want you to show us your apartment and some of this Western decor <laughs> that we were yeah. joking about before we went live. So I'll—I'll I'll pull this one because it's the closest thing. Uh, so this is a lamp with some nice, nice shade. You know, it's very Western, and then it's a boot. This, it is a play. I hope it's not a play on the leg lamp, but you know, this is a <laughs> Sun Valley has many things. It's, Got a very particular aesthetic in some of these locations. Show us the gun holster. Oh, the gun holster is way back there, but I will show you from afar. Yeah, let's, let's go on a little trip. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> I love this gun stuff. holster by your bed. I mean, I, I'm from <laughs> California. That's really weird to me, but you know, maybe there, maybe some folks. That's a necessary thing for them. Sure, sure. Yeah, out in the country, you never know what you're going to come up against. <laughs> Coyotes? I don't know. Yeah, right. um, but yeah, it's been wild. I mean, like you said, we just put in this soundscape system here. Uh, going back to the Voxel, we're going to have shows again. You know, the world opening back up and having new new equipment to open up with is really fun. You were one of the few people I know who kept really busy during the whole COVID thing. Tell us about what you were working on with that, because I think it's interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I did a couple projects like everyone, you know, we, we, everyone had to pivot or find different things. So at the Voxel, we were lucky enough, lucky or unlucky, uh, we had just opened in January of 2020. Uh, so by the time COVID hit, we had done a show that was supposed to be our demo show um, to see how what we we're doing. And then so we're like, okay, well, we still want to open eventually. Uh, so we just did a bunch of maintenance. And so we just were getting the theater ready because it was an empty space when I walked in. So we're like fine fine tuning the details of the sound system and chairs and all the things you, that go into that. And I also worked uh, with Woolly Mammoth Theater Company um, doing another filmed, a film to live film piece. I don't know what, it has, it has to have a new name after COVID. You know, like it's not theater, it's not film, it's a theater film, I guess. Um, and that was a really fun project with doing live bands in there. And we did, and even the music festival here last summer, we did entirely virtual. So we did 105 musicians recorded either at home or local hubs at their at their hometowns. And then we synced all of those tracks for five remote sync pieces. There was like 140 tracks that we were working with in 27 different locations. It was wild. Yeah, I mean, the thing you were telling me that blew my mind is trying to ship DPA mics and accessories oh, right. and all of this stuff out to all of these locations and keep track of all this crap. Yeah, I mean, luckily enough, yeah, we were Symphony's mic inventory. We, we were sent out DPAs to every single player, every single like string instrument, and we sent them with that and you, a Focusrite interface and a tripod and light and all this sort of stuff. And one of the best comments was funny. We had a fleet of, of audio people like editing and mixing all this sort of stuff. I didn't touch much audio, to be honest. I was doing so many logistics. Uh, but one of the audio engineers reached out to me. He's like, where did they record this this violin duet at a lake? Like, did they dub over that? I'm like, no, no, that's the clip on DPA outside at the lake. You know, like, he's like, how did you, what? How do we do you send DPA to the middle of Missouri? And we're like, that's what we did. Yeah, welcome to COVID. <laughs> yeah, what, whatever you had to do to make it work. So it was fun. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I'm glad you kept busy. And more importantly, I'm glad we're getting back to work and starting to hear some PA systems again, at least here in the US, you know, the vaccine rollout's been happening and we're, we're starting yeah. to see some gigs. 
Yeah. And I mean, our big project, or my big project for the last six months or so has been getting this sound system out here working and getting all the logistics and going for transforming our, our lawn space to a, a soundscape system, which has been, uh, you know, it's been interesting because I think Matt said it best at one point, we can just keep throwing the soundscape processor at things and it just works. You know, like you, it's like a Swiss army knife of some kind. And we'll get yeah, more because, there, you know, here, here we're seeing the picture here. There's a PA and under the tent handling amplification uh, or, or, or does, yeah, there's, so there's some amplification happening. For yeah. Me, right? yeah. We can, we can, we can roll it back a sec. So like Sun Valley, yeah, we have a giant pavilion. Most people are familiar with outdoor amphitheater type things. Uh, but our lawn, you know, the extra seating, you can't see inside at all. So you do have your main PA in the bowl, 1500 seats in there. And then after that, the, the lawn system is basically its its own thing. We, it's very separate in its sound quality and the vibe. Lots of people just go out there and drink cocktails, and it's a, it's a good time to watch watch a show. But it is made up of about 48 speaker poles. Um, so it's like a speaker forest of just this distributed sound system that was uh, the original con like conception was in 2008 when the venue was, was made. But we've now taken that that taken to that design that was just mainly a left right left right pa for with delays and made right. it to left, a right, really left right left right left right left right left right left right, left right. <laughs> oh, delay 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 a ring you know move out a little bit further left right left right left right so you it was mono basically you know you had one one source all your symphony coming at you at once and um we to the credit we had an old system called layers in there um which did some great room acoustics um, but that was it. It you know, only did room acoustics, and um, it was just uh, there's something missing usually. Uh, you're like, this is a great experience. Um, the audience loved it, but you know we can go a little bit further uh, with the sound quality there and the intimacy. Mm -hmm. I think. I mean, I remember one of the very first things we talked about, like we can see here in this picture. You know, there's there's the the tent, the pavilion where there's a PA and an orchestra, but then there's also this video mm -hmm. screen off to the left. Yeah. And for different events and for different applications, it was kind of hard for us to decide, well, do we want sound to localize to the tent or do we want sound to localize to the imagery on the screen? And that was one of the reasons why you were interested in end scene, right? To be able to just place a sound object and have everybody's attention move to the desired focal point. Yeah, and we did that. It was really having end scene was pretty critical at the end because at one point we were thinking about we're like oh maybe we just need the acoustic model the acoustic part of this and we can use the processing and i think <laughs> the one day you sent you told me you're like well if we do that that's you know that's some some processing time some install time just doing all the matrixing end scene just does that so why don't you just get end scene i was like oh right 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 uh, because we're talking <laughs> about adding end scene later and yeah. on, on the first phase of this project, just doing end space and emulated room acoustics. And, and so I just yeah. wanted to say it another way, because I totally forgot about this, but this is a really good point. I was like, yeah. okay, you can save the money and not get end scene yet, but we're yeah. gonna have to add two extra days of install for measuring, tuning, and timing this PA. Yeah. But and with end scene, you just place a sound object and it does all of the timing for you automatically in multiple dimensions. Yeah. And I mean, to like from conception of the system to I think even that moment it was like, oh yeah, that's really what we want because it's like, okay, we can we can replicate the acoustic engine that was there. We can make it come out of all speakers, which is already fantastic, a huge improvement. Um, but like the idea to be like, oh no, we really want to place things because even in an orchestra that's 400 feet away, having that little bit of spacing out of objects of the orchestra, it makes a huge difference. And then being able to go like, oh, your attention's there? Whoop, it's there. Two seconds later, that's it. No, I, having anyone be able to do that and not just have to sit there for a two days doing delay matrixes is just was just a, uh -huh. a huge payoff. So after the commissioning, I remember we did kind of an initial demo for, for the, the big wigs executive yeah. director and whatnot, right? And and we yeah. switched two different settings of Ensign using um, some playback of a Mahler recording that you had from a previous season. You wanna talk about those two settings yeah. and what we were doing there? Yeah, yeah, so I, the the brief specialness of that Mahler recording, it was our last concert in person in 2019. Uh, it's our biggest concert with 200 choir members. Um, and 
we had multi-track recording, like you said, and we put it in cinematic versus realistic was two of the two of the options we had. Um, and then we also tried, I don't know if you want to talk about the mono versus not, but that's that's a little bit of it. We tried to Let's talk about the, what, the realistic versus a cinema. Describe what those settings right. were. So realistic, we were like, okay, let's put these objects on stage, like where they would be in the orchestra and let, you know, end, end scene do the rest. Like here we have our basses in our bass section, violins, violins, and we, you know, space everything accordingly. And it sounded great. Because even though we have our stage space, which is now 300 feet from our first speakers that are, that are, that have the soundscape processing coming out of them. Because like our, that's one note is that, um, we have our stage and then the first line of soundscape is at the pergola. So the, on the lawn, we're not even touching the stage yet. Um, and just having that spacing of the stage was like fantastic. And we, we then were like, okay, so what if we make it cinematic where we put the orchestra around you? So we put it as if, you know, the, you're in the maestro stand and the violins are where they would be, but your, your audience members in the center of the lawn and there's like violins kind of to your left and, Base is kind of to your right, and just that kind of you could switch between the two settings, and you go, it went like whoop, whoop, whoop. You know, it was like you, you else, you're just like pulling of your depth. It, just with the sound quality was just really cool, and it was a very effective thing to show the artistic team. <laughs> they were they were pretty happy, and I remember there was yeah. a little bit of crying for the first time hearing <laughs> their orchestra in a long yes. time. Yeah, I, I I start with that when I tell people, it was like, it was so good. Our artistic director cried. They're like, what? And I was like, okay, well, yes, it was um, immensely good. It was amazingly good, but it was also her first time hearing the orchestra. And because I think it sounded so real, like it sounded like they were there that she, she, she teared up and it was a lot of emotions, you know, first time hearing them in an outdoor space, like you would uh, mm -hmm. in two years after all that we've gone through. Um, yeah, well, and yeah. with those two settings, we talked about the ability for you if you're doing kind of a more intimate moment or a really traditional piece, you can place sound objects way out at the stage. So it sounds mm -hmm. like sound is coming from the performer at the stage. But then when you do Star Wars, something a little yeah. bit bigger, grandiose, family friendly, then you can do the cinematic version where you transport the listener to the maestro platform like you said so the orchestra's all around yeah and we'll be excited we'll we won't be doing any of those this year but we definitely have them in the lineup and having that ability and even on different concerts you know like we said the Mahler was a great piece to have kind of that surround effect you know you want to be on stage because there's so much going on on stage that being having stuff come from the sides and coming at you is is a really really nice experience uh, yeah, those Mahler crescendos, trying to amplify them through a left-right PA is always really tough because you have so yeah. much content coming through. It's so thick. It, yeah. It's really hard to maintain any intelligibility and clarity. But once you can space it out, now it feels big. It feels like Mahler, and you can hear yeah. the separate sections. I know. And for me, I, you know, especially when I try and mix it, because we, we amplify it for the bowl as well. It's like getting that choir out from everything is usually always a, a hard it's a hard time just because there's so much going on, on stage and like obviously there's no no real players there when we were playing it back but you could hear the choir because they're 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 in front of you and then you put everything else to the side just having that distance in, in your listening environment was, was huge like you said mm -hmm. it's just i mean if I, like i said i <laughs> we were joking it's like can we just like put soundscape in my pocket i'll just take it on all my gigs because <laughs> it's like just that ability without even plugging into things is like oh i was would have spent hours trying to pan and delay you know futzing with with however you do with symphony stuff and without everyone else's concerts with with other con rock concerts and everything yeah i mean i feel like ever since we did the first installation at dinkelspiel auditorium at stanford you've been kind of moving from venue to venue and always wanting the soundscape thing back so i just kind of follow you around installing soundscape <laughs> yeah looks well, like i could do it this really uh, this long way that we know everyone does you can do it with processing you can do it with reverbs i was like or i could do this this thing that I can press a button and everything works, you know? Mm -hmm. Why would I not want that? Everyone wants easy to use and of course. quality, you know? Mm -hmm. All right, so we got our first comment. Fabian says uh, that that they use Soundscape at St. Gallen, Switzerland. I'd be really curious to hear what they're doing with it out there. So, so maybe if Fabian wants to throw in another comment, that would be kind of cool. 
Um, yeah. And and great reminder, please comments, questions, keep them coming. We want to make sure that uh, you guys get what you need out of this. And yeah, Kevin, we haven't talked about N Space yet. I mean, that was kind of the initial call yeah. about using Soundscape <laughs> at Sun Valley Symphony was just some more flexibility within an electroacoustic system, right? Yeah, the electroacoustics have been huge. And that, like I said, because the lawn environment is so different out there uh, than what you're experiencing in the bowl, um, the intent has always been to be like, we're gonna try and bring that back to the outdoor environment. We wanna create a hall outside, which is a little, you explain to some people, they're like, why do you wanna do that? And you know, if you ever do audio, that's that's the goal sometimes with symphonies. Um, and our old system, well, had its was great in, in some capacities, but was a little limiting. Um, we had, it was an interesting setup where there was the speaker poles I mentioned had a rear and a forward facing speaker where only the rear speaker had the electroacoustics in them. Um, and then the front facing speaker was just like a PA, you know, it, that's what you right, just totally dry console. Yeah. Um, and we did a lot of AB tests, you know, what works, what doesn't. And it, it, it's huge. They both add and you're, they're both necessary. But I was like, well, what if the soundscape, you know, it, it's taking all those convolutions and it's putting in, in all the speakers if we use the soundscape like and space we've just doubled our speaker count rather than having a speaker for each priority we've doubled our speaker count and what we can do with them um because and and space will do the algorithms like any speaker <laughs> and it just puts them where it, it thinks they need to be um right because we see that a lot with the electroacoustic systems they have yeah. their speaker deployment totally separate mm -hmm. from an amplification system that has its speaker deployment. So they're two completely isolated, unrelated speaker systems. Yeah. But with Soundscape, not only are all speakers part of electroacoustics, but all speakers are also part of and seen in object-based mixing. So when you guys get into Star Wars and you want the TIE fighter to fly around the audience, yeah. now those rear firing speakers that were used for electroacoustics will work as a delay ring from the rear of that TIE mm -hmm. fighter sound in the back. Yeah. 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 It's, I mean, and I feel like some of this is just like, as much as I love it artistically and as much as I love it to achieve the vision, some of it's become logistical. Like that same speaker, like we had these speaker poles that are limited by like, I can't, if I really want to do this the other way, I'd have to double, keep this speaker count doubled and find ways to throw farther on these smaller speakers. Um, so adding heavier speakers, adding more boxes to the same pole, and I, I can't, you know, there's, that's my limiting factor there. Or like in Dink, it was getting kind of budget. You know, like I don't want to double up my speaker system for, why? <laughs> you know, uh, if, I, if I don't have to. Um, so being able to use both the speaker as, in both ways, yeah, as a delay, as we said, for effects or anything, and have my electroacoustics coming out of them, it's huge, uh, just combining those. Because you you take what you would have spent on a soundscape system box, and you're like, okay, that or double the speaker count amplifiers. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, and so now that you've done five soundscape systems, I know we kind of go through this routine every time we, we talk <laughs> about design and stuff, but yeah. do you agree that in the end, it's just an issue of like, put speakers where you can and yeah. let the processor do it? Oh, a hundred percent. I would not say there could be not more true statement about Soundscape. Um, you know, we spent I spent so long in Dink trying to figure out where's the optimal placement because that was an interesting system. Where I could put speakers wherever. It was a new install, doing whatever we want, and spent so so long trying to figure out like what's the best placement for all these speakers. And you know, as you, as you do with consultating and doing new building, and then to Sun Valley, I'm like, I'm stuck. This is where my speaker poles are. I can't make new ones. Um, and just having that the ability on Soundscape, be like, just telling it where the speaker pole is. And you're like, hey, it's over there. Figure it out. And um, just having that flexibility is is huge. And like, even in, when we're pointing and aligning the speakers, it's like, where do you want the speaker? And I was like, about about here, because Soundscape's going to figure out where it needs to get, what it's going to do. Right. Yeah. Right. So you just put the speakers up. You make sure that the speaker locations and the orientation is reflected mm -hmm. within the array calc file. Now the processor is aware of the speaker positions and it just does what it can with the available loudspeakers. And just yeah. to drive the point home, at Sun Valley, that system is not symmetrical. 
It is sometimes even numbers of speakers, sometimes odd numbers of speakers. I mean, it's sometimes mono locations. As you get further back in the lawn, the system becomes increasingly mono for the really far field, which we didn't see in the picture. I mean, there's yeah. nothing about this deployment that is good from a from a <laughs> traditional sound system point of view. No, I mean, it, it was, it's always been a compromise because it's like, okay, you're delaying rings. Like it's semi like circular. So there's rings that go out and get smaller, but it's like, yeah, where are you timelining to? Where's the center? What, you know, what do you tune to? Cause like you said, it's on a ring that gets smaller, that goes at an angle. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's like, it's very odd position like to be in if you're going to tune it normally uh, and just being able to say like, Hey, soundscape, this is where a speaker is. And it's like, okay, I'll, figure, I'll, I'll put some room propagation in for that repository location in a concert hall. Yeah. Um, and it's not having to worry about delaying them. Like the, there's a huge struggle all, always about like switching the delay from the lawn video to the stage to a different location, and like re-entering all those values and re-timeline it. Be like, oh, just move that sound object over there and it's all done. And done. And, and then just make sure that you have the proper temperature entered it on the processor because delay times change slightly depending yes. on different temperature and the processor handles it. Yeah. This yeah, is really yeah. the system. The system specialist. You you know the very specific. You're you're going into more detail. I'm like, this is the great cool thing I love to use. Uh, I'll explain to you. I, I we'll just think it's cool. Later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, how many times have we retuned the lawn system because of temperature change? That was never a thing we've ever done with traditional PAs, right? Yeah. We never re-smarted it and found new delay times because it's nighttime instead of the morning now. Yeah. Just. Dealt with it. <laughs> You're like, well, right. Did it then. So more flexible and more accurate now. Yeah, definitely. So tell you what, I have a couple of uh, video clips that I think Selena yeah. can get queued up for us. We want to listen to those and then get to a couple of comments and questions because we're starting to get some questions, which is really exciting. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, so talk about Bing first. No, no, no. Let's okay. let's stay on Sun Valley for okay. a moment. So for Selena, this is going to be video three and then video four. Um, number three is the first thing. I think you've heard me do this a couple of times now, Kevin. I, I have this track of a snare drum, just single hits. And it's a great mm -hmm. way for me to double check the timing of the system and hear the acoustics at work. Yeah. And then once we start with some simple content like that, uh, we have a clip of us playing back the multi-channel Mahler recording from your last live show. And uh, my favorite part about that is all the smiles of us as we're kind of hearing the rig do its thing for the first time. Yeah. Um, so if you got headphones, put them on. It'll help. Um, f f you know, full disclosure though, this is an iPhone video. It's not exactly high quality recording, but you know, I oh. figure an iPhone video through headphones is better than an iPhone video through laptop speakers. Yeah. I'll get you a binaural recording later. Yeah. Good. Actually, we have the gear. Great. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. That sounds fun. Yeah. Uh, all right, Selena, whenever you're ready, let's uh, do both those videos, number three and then number four. You like my artful fade up there with the camera? I, I saw the pan up to the sky of the mall. That's great. It felt appropriate with that choir. Yeah, that no, was good. <laughs> yeah, uh, and we noticed in the first video, uh, some of the crew was out there with the tape measure, and they're actually confirming speaker positions to make sure they're in the rate calc file because that replaces our smart rig. No longer are we yeah. finding delay times, right? Yeah, it's my tape measure, and my physical tape measure, and my laser tape are almost now more important than my RTA mic, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. which is a funny a funny turn. All right, so we uh, got a couple of comments. Fabian followed up. Um, yeah. Oh, so the St. Geller Festival in Switzerland uh, that's been going on for five years there. Uh, that's Fun. interesting. Yeah, and there's a link here that I want to check out. Um, it's good. I love hearing about people doing soundscape outside the US since I'm really just focused on the Americas here. Uh, yeah. and. And 
And to be honest, when it comes to outdoor classical stuff in Europe, they're using a lot more of this more commonly than we are here. Yeah, I'm I'm slowly seeing. I mean, I think even here, the trend on using electroacoustics is starting to pick up more now. I feel like Europe was a little bit ahead of us. We had some some options, but outdoor was kind of this nebulous space until recently mm -hmm. for in terms of electroacoustics. All right. So so question from someone in Vietnam here. Are signal sources located on the stage area reflecting earlier than soundscape or in the soundscape front of house region. And I think this comes back to the the kind of um, traditional versus cinematic modes we were talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think in, in this, to answer that question, we have them located at the stage. So I think our sources would be where the stage is. So like in, in Array Calc, we have our stage positioned where it is in normal time, even though the first delay speakers that have soundscape coming out of them are way way far away yeah you know, they're, they're like 100 normal, feet yeah. from the stage or something um but that way because soundscapes algorithms and the the all the processing goes on in the background is true to real to to be to the space so everything is accurate to real time um so yeah, be the same and, as and in fact so sorry i just got yeah, really excited because i remember there's yeah. this whole other use case because when you're not in there doing full multi-object soundscape they have guest shows coming in like traditional rock shows that that are just feeding a stereo to the house pa and you just need the lawn system to be a delay rig and and so that is just a mono feed in a soundscape with a single sound object mm -hmm. and we we delay it to the house pa under the tent by just moving the sound object until we hear the the sound like click in yeah yeah exactly and that was i mean that use case alone again so you want to smarting and we're sitting there with your, your rig and I mean, certainly you can, there's no nothing wrong with it, but how easy is that? Like just, I'm going to drag it. Oh, there it is. Perfect. So there with your, your computer on Wi-Fi and click in. And then the other use case that follows that is we have that one location that we use for, you know, a normal concert on the stage. And we have just one other sound object, one of our 64 sound objects that's over at the video screen that was in the picture. Um, and have that just placed at the video screen, like where the video screen would be, and then everything delays to that. So if you're watching the movie, everything's perfectly in time for just the movie. Um, and what was cool and a, a side benefit I didn't realize until we did it was even taking video delay into account. So like sometimes your video engineers or all the the processing that goes on between the, the signal and the source could be like a bunch of different things. Maybe you don't know what all of them are, so you don't know you can't add up the time and delay. And you're like, oh, let me just move that sound object back until it clicks into place. And right, until you see the video kind of and the audio yeah. kind of get in sync. Yeah, exactly. So, so the first concert I heard when I was there actually pertains, I think, to Tony's question here. Um, the first concert I heard when I was there at the end of our commissioning wasn't in the pergola. It was actually at the video screen. So we were able to time align this PA, not only to localize to the stage that was set up underneath the video screen, but also to time align it closer to those artists on that stage, right? Yeah, yeah. And that was, I mean, it was fantastic. And we, you know, we, we found out some things like when in that scenario, you know, we found out our mains need to be a bit beefier than they were. Uh, but the localization of that was fantastic and uh, even with our, our weird sound system where it curves at the stage and there's all sorts of angles going on it everything just sounded like it was coming from the video wall instead of the stage which was fantastic yeah right because when we move sound object over there we're heavily reliant on the surround speakers which were pretty small right yeah yeah i would say you know full disclosure as, as designing these, you know, we, we thought of, we we're like, okay, we thought of that. And I think even so, we were going to put some big speakers on the video wall and do just logistical issues. We couldn't in mean, this phase. That's why I love phases. You can keep adding things. Um, but we realized, you know, if you're going to have a, a soundscape system that goes, that uses multiple points as its main source, you, have, you should have the speakers to back it up at that location. So you should have like, we had small and large speakers or surrounds and mains. And we found out in that location, we only had small speakers that were acting as mains. So they weren't um, as they were driving more than they should have. <laughs> but, you know, we, we yeah, evened yeah. it out. 
Yeah, well, phase two of this project is to reevaluate speaker models and positions. Uh, phase yeah. one was really just getting processing and amplification in place, right? Yeah, and getting just re replacing all the, the structure because uh, I mean that's a cool thing, and it's not the the most streamlined. But we only have the DMB soundscape processor. We have the amps because we future proofed in the DS tens. Uh, but the actual speakers are the old EAW speakers that we had from beforehand. Um, just, you know, because we're, like I said, we're phasing, we're going to get things going. And the processor was the thing we knew we needed to replace now. Um, it was our biggest failure point. Um, and just being able to be like, you know, we, we ballparked what DMB speaker is in the processor, but that, that flexibility alone be like, oh, I'll get DMB eventually, hopefully. And, mm -hmm. um, but for now, we're just using the other speakers. And that just mm -hmm. that fact was fantastic. You know, having mm -hmm. flexibility there. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so Hamish had a comment first. Uh, love the creative application possibilities. I think this is a really good use case, you know, example with all these kind of different things going on. And then he had a question. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a way you can create tracking of live object moving? Uh, any hacks, he says. So, so yes, <laughs> um, we, we work with all major tracking systems. Um, you know, Black Tracks is one of our favorite, our friends up in Canada. That's a, a camera-based infrared solution. Uh, we use that for our internal demos. Um, so the, the actor wears a beacon, which, which is an invisible infrared light that the cameras can see, and they can track up to 64 actors and control their 64 sound objects in soundscape in real time. Uh, which is absolutely crucial when you talk about Broadway style theater. Uh, we use it a lot with corporate events. Uh, and if there's already a tracking system in the system, say for the sake of video or lighting, we can grab that signal, pipe it into the DS100 as well. Uh, in fact, you could run up to four different tracking systems in the soundscape at the same time. We have yet to do that, Kevin. How come you haven't done a tracking system? They're expensive. I prefer yeah. QLab, the other company that I work for, because. Uh, uh -huh. You can, because in QLab, the other integration for people who aren't familiar, um, has a DS100 in its networked uh, objects you can choose from. So you can create a network queue and you can, there's a little XYZ plane. You say, hey, DS100, move this object one in this plane. And it'll just right. move that object in that. Either to snap plane. to a new location or to move okay. along a trajectory that you can draw. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For my application so far, QLab has, has been spot on for what I need. Uh, but eventually, I'll, I'd love to try the Black Jacks thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we use QLab a lot for our internal demos as well. You know, video playback, multi-channel audio, console snapshots, lighting presets, DS100 control, all that stuff. Yeah. It's... I don't know how I'd get through uh, Infocom <laughs> demo hung over for the ninth day in a row without QLab to make it easy for me. Yeah. I'll never forget the the one concert I wasn't allowed to use QLab. This is a personal plug, so shameless, uh, sort of. Uh, I had s eight different iPods I was handed and had Post-it notes for what song and the person's code for what they are. I'm like, I'm never doing this again. I'm requiring QLab for these things. <laughs> right. All right, so there's another question uh, from our old friend Bill at Brooks Audio, uh, who, by the way, does a lot of cool spatial stuff. If everybody wants to check out his uh, YouTube channel, he does some binaural recordings and comparisons of different uh, spatial technologies. I've been watching, Bill. I see you out there. Um, so he said, uh, there's no system at the stage, only in the field. What is a transition like between acoustic and amplified as you walk out of the back of the tent? And so to be clear, there is a PA under the tent. Yes. And for your Sun Valley Symphony, orchestral stuff it's used sparingly um it's really not used at all uh the, the artistic staff like the acoustic profile of the hall itself so it's got these like marble walls it was it was had it was designed for the symphony uh to an extent um so our conductor and our artistic team really like like that acoustic so for most of our concerts within 95 90 percent of our concerts it's completely acoustic in the hall and then the uh transition starts basically at the back row of the pavilion is where the first line of speakers are um and in the past that had always been a delicate balance you know we, we that is the first line of speakers and the transition uh, we did some gain shading and we did some playing around with acoustic with uh reverbs um it was a little abrupt, I would say. You know, you go from kind of distantly hearing things in the hall to like, oh, there's the violin section. Um, 
but I would say definitely now with the soundscape system, just off what we heard, it sounds a little bit more natural because you're not just hearing everything out of every speaker with the second you walk past that threshold line of the, of the concert hall. Um, so we'll see actually a little bit out, you know, in a week I'll have the first rehearsal with a symphony on stage and that'll be a fun experiment. Um, but with the recordings, it was vastly improved from what it had been before with just the, the mono AB system. Um, just that, that's jump. Mm -hmm. What I'm interested to hear when you do the kind of natural setup with your sound objects so that you have the first mm -hmm. violin objects mimicking their real placement on stage and your contrabass objects mimicking their real position on stage. I'm wondering how much smoother it will be since each section of the orchestra is time aligned and delayed separately to the delay rig, you know, because... Mm -hmm. I, I hear where Bill's going with this. When you walk from an acoustic setup where you have spatial awareness and you hear the first violins over there and the bass is over there, and then you walk into a mono PA, it feels like blunt force trauma. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so so yeah. now that everything's kind of delayed separately in multiple axes, I wonder how much better it's going to be. I can't wait. I wish I was there with you that first time. Yeah, I'm very excited. I'm going to spend, so I'm as also think I'm usually the front of house engineer. So I'm, I designed this whole system for our lawn engineer. So he's going to get to have a fun time. I'm going to just walk out there the whole time and see how this all sounds. Cause mm -hmm. yeah, I, I mean, like I said, we did a lot of work in the past to, to minimize that blunt force trauma, um, you know, with gain and, and other tricks of reverb. And there was the old spatial audio system coming at you a different direction, but it, I think it'll be a lot smoother. Um, just walking back out there and uh -huh. eventually when we get some cardioid speakers out there, it'll be even better. Yeah. It was one of the things we talked about, you know, those pergola speakers are mounted basically above the head of the last row of, of the pavilion audience in the seats. Yeah. And so, but they're kind of the primary source going out for the lawn. So how do you make it work for the lawn without bleeding back into into the pavilion and distracting those audience members. And we talk about some Y series or V series or 24 S with a dipole speaker to really control yeah. the yeah, conversion, con right? Yeah. Controlling that sound. Cause you know, the, the biggest trouble we get into and we used to get into is like, if we drive that, that lawn system, especially the pergola a little too hard, you know, that you definitely get jarring it's a giant experience for the people that are underneath the speaker or behind the speaker because the, the energy off the back end is just hitting the tent and you know going back down or you know it's so controlling that will just separate them a little bit more but also controlling it with the the end scene and end space running i think it's just going to be like just money in terms of like transition and seamless experience for anybody anybody who ends up walking most people don't walk through through a symphony concert but it'll mm -hmm. be a nice a nice thing to have. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so Hamish asked a follow-up question. Maybe we can get through a couple of questions, and then I want to touch on Dinkelspiel again. If yeah, we've got the time. Okay, all right. So Hamish had a follow-up about the tracking. Um, is there a way? Uh, sorry. Um, oh, thanks for talking about the tracking and black tracks and the types of tracking systems. Uh, is there a way I can gain access to a document? I can explore this information. Um, there was a little bit of information in a document at dbaudio.com. If you go to downloads and do a search for TI document, what you're going to look for is TI 501. I hope that's right. Uh, soundscape. Uh, maybe Sarah or Selena could look it up, make sure I'm not crazy. Um, there's a technical information document or a TI doc, as we call it, that talks about um, all of the stuff within the DS100 and scene and space, uh, and there's a little bit there talking about external control. And also, if you have a more specific question, email support at dbaudio.com. We can talk about tracking systems and the way that interfaces with the DS100. Um, all right, so here's a question. Uh, Adam asks, what would you have done differently on your earlier systems now that you've done several? What do you think, Kevin? <laughs> oh, boy. Um, hindsight's think, 2020, right? I know there's so many things. Um, I would say I would put a lot less emphasis on particularly like overheads for a while. I think in Dink, we, we put a lot of emphasis on our overhead system. Um, it's like, it's a lot of speakers up there in Dink and the ceiling on a five S's and, and really like those surrounds and the, the mains is really what carries a lot of that. So that, that's one small thing. Um, 
I might, I'll answer this slowly as I go back because I've just kept moving. <laughs> so I haven't had too much time to reflect. Uh, but I think my main takeaway so far in just going forward is just how flexible I can be. Like I, I went back to Stanford while I was in California it was a week or two ago. And my the, it's the same processor, it's the same stuff in there. And yet we used it so differently, even though they're both for symphony and they're both for like virtual acoustics. And just the way we used it, I was like almost had to re re remember how we did that. So just keeping in mind, like how much flexibility I have once I have that processor in there and not to get too carried away and like, oh, this speaker has to be 16 feet from this speaker and what, I don't know, just get, getting carried away with uh, dimensions of the space in terms of like where things have to be. As long as I can tell the soundscape system where it's gonna be, that's the main, the main key. Yeah, uh, I find a lot, especially kind of consultants, they really wanna know the exact spacing of speakers from me yeah. as a DMB soundscape person. And I always, I, you know, they don't want to hear it, but I just kind of want to say, yeah. like, just put them wherever you can put them. Yeah. You know, and they're like, well, what does that mean? Do I need 32 or do I need 11? And I'm like, I don't know, more is better. But yeah. 11's fine, you know? <laughs> like, but, but we're so used yeah. to thinking about things in this yeah. like, kind of hard rule way of, of designing audio. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy. And, oh, you know what? I think one thing I would say, this, the sides and surrounds. I, I always am like, oh, I don't want to hit people in the face. I don't want to pummel them from the sides. Like, I, I want to be careful, like, what I'm putting on the sides. Uh, so I usually end up downsizing those speakers. I mean, in, in Dink, we put columns, which are amazing. If anybody hasn't heard the column speakers, I can give them a huge thumbs up because we have 27 of them. Uh, but you can, like, really put whatever speaker you need to get your throw on the side because the processing inside isn't going to pummel that person next to you. I mean, yeah, it's going to be a little loud if you're really pushing the whole system, but it's very proportional to the side and, and trying to put little small speakers. If you have them, that's if all you have, that's great. But like those sides and, and rears, don't be afraid to like give them the juice that they need. Don't, don't be like downsizing your speaker to, I don't know, not pummel the closest person. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, because Soundscape is, is distributing across a, a whole line of speakers in a more intelligent way than we've had in the past, we see a lot more of a proximity effect of people closest to the speakers. And and like this picture shows here, uh, the columns are great in Dinkelspiel because they have such good vertical directivity. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll never forget the first time we kicked them up and turned them up really loud. Someone on a lift was like, holy crap, is that coming out of the columns? Because I couldn't believe how loud they were. Yeah, I know. And just yeah, like, we I mean, uh -huh. the coupled force of them together, too. It's like, you can be small if you need them to be small. But when you start getting all those things working together, like, you're blown away by how much sound it produces. <laughs> like, it's, it's it doesn't feel like the dB measurement is accurate at that point, because you're just like, oh, it's coming out of so many speakers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, I mean, we know anecdotally that once we put and scene and soundscape on a speaker system, it gets louder, which allows us to downsize speakers. We're still kind of wrestling with how to gauge this. What is the metric? Um, mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I've learned over time. Every time I do a soundscape system, I kind of keep downsizing the speakers more. And I have yet to find that design where I just went too small. But it's surprising how much you get out of a system. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I guess my comment is just like, don't try not to overthink those, that sizing, I guess. It's like, if you have small speakers, use them. They'll, they'll do what they can. They'll do amazingly if, if you want to put big speakers or, I don't know. Mm -hmm. it, it's just the surrounds are always like a, you know, in, in theater when I was doing four or 5.1, you're like, I got to have big speakers because they only come in at two locations in the back. And now it's like, you mm -hmm. can use whatever you have. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so let's talk about Dinklespear here for a minute. I've got, I've got an image up and a couple more to show. Uh, this is the room that I mentioned that has two soundscape systems in it. And this was the first project that you and I did, Kevin. It was. It started a long time ago. <laughs> God, it feels like a lifetime, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a, a fun project just because of how long we spent <laughs> talking about getting a sound system. Um, luckily, campus. long enough. Yeah, luckily long enough to come back to a sound to D&B Soundscape um, and for the product to actually get released, which was a, a fun little tidbit. Was that That's right. That's right. Because it was not released when we started talking about it. 
That's right. You went to Germany and talked to people and, and you were, you were really an early adopter here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So one system here is running uh, these columns and T10s uses the mains. Uh, those T10s, by the way, they can be rehung as left, right line arrays in case a guest artist really insists on it. Um, and that's run by a front of house engineer, you know, using object based mixing and a computer and a mixer, just like we kind of picture soundscape systems being used. But the interesting part for me is the secondary system, which is actually run on this touch screen on the side of the stage. So this is just a customized R1 file running on a tiny touch screen. Uh, mm -hmm. And this virtual orchestra shell uh, runs exclusively using the suspended microphones over the stage. And the reason uh, you originally came to me with this one was because the Stanford Symphony Orchestra and other ensembles had just gotten a brand new multi hundred million dollar concert hall called Bing Concert Hall, which is this beautiful natural acoustic chamber hall, right? Nagata Acoustics was the lead uh, uh, consultant on this mm -hmm. design, beautiful acoustic space. But when they book other events, they get kicked out and go back to Dinkelspiel for their rehearsals, which is such a different acoustic space. It was a hardship for them. Yeah. And uh, you and me worked out a deal with Stanford, right? Where we we flew Simon, the man behind End Space, over to yeah. Bing Concert Hall. We spent three days doing sign sweeps and measuring the room, and then we emulate Bing Concert Hall in Dinkelspiel. Yeah, this was the this I think was still a pinnacle of a fun project because <laughs> that ability to have like the fact that it was such a, a amazing space naturally, and that it was. Uh, you guys wanted it in your library and there was an you know, incentive there and that we needed it on our side was just like, okay, how do we make this, you know, if you're looking at these pictures, those two spaces shouldn't sound alike ever. Um, but those are the spaces that we go between because that's just what we had. Those are the buildings that are there. And how do you make the second space better? You know, what do you, do you make it actually just try and sound better, like acoustically better with better tiling, better wood? And that gets expensive, and you know we had a, a directive that I couldn't do that. <laughs> to, and to, and get cut it off the, their knees, right? And a place like Tinklespiel, you would never get an, an RT length, a reverb length, mm -hmm. like Bing Concert Hall would just never be possible through yeah. traditional means. So, like, how do you improve that space to a usable thing? And it's virtual acoustics. Like, I mean, that's really the only option at that point because we can't physically change the building enough to make it work. I mean, if we could, it'd be financially uh, unsustainable. So mm -hmm. yeah, getting an acoustics thing for the stage. And that was actually the main drive of the, the auditorium. It was like, yes, we, our audience is important and we want them to have a good experience too, but we want this experience for the people on stage. Mm -hmm. uh, so for the And without, without technical burden, it doesn't need to be yeah. a sound engineer there every time a rehearsal happens, the musical director or the orchestra librarian can just walk over and hit the Bing concert hall button on the touch screen and yep. put themselves in that acoustic space. Yeah, and it you know, it was it was a huge undertaking in terms of like trying to come up with this with the soundscape thing, and you know we were again using the soundscape system how exactly how it may they may have thought it was going to get used at the beginning, but you know the stage is its own space, like the on stage thing is its own performance space, so we just treated it like you would mm -hmm. an audience. And yeah. so then there was a question in the chat, you know, how were we measuring the speaker positions? And we're just measuring from a global point of origin, which we've defined at part of the beginning of the design. Uh, and in Dinkelspiel, I think it was just downstage center. So we measured every speaker yep. left to right, forward and back and up to down from downstage center, right? Yeah, that was a fun thing. And I think Adam's on the chat, our installer, we had 114 speakers all over the stage and they had to do that, that mapping everywhere. And the, Sorry, a little tangent. They, they taped it all out one day, and the janitor picked up all the tapes. Uh, yeah, right. I remember you saying, uh, you're like, in years of working in this theater, the janitor has never picked up all of our spike yeah. marks, and this one day yeah. it happens. But yeah, yeah. So from that one point, we had our all everything was calculated from there, and that's where we we put the locations for all these speakers, and that was our that was our time zero. That was where we we decided we, everything would come from. Yeah, so um, then the processor knows the speaker positions. It handles all of the delay times automatically. We're not entering any delay times in the system at all. And then to commission it, we we had this really sophisticated measurement <laughs> method, right, Kevin? Yeah. I mean, because you know, you sit in this room that doesn't 
And this is actually gets to an interesting thing of like psychoacoustics, which we actually talked about a lot on this project. It's like, how do you get a space like that looks like Ding to sound like a place that looks like Bing? And it, at a certain point, your brain just doesn't put it together. It can sound exactly the same or more so. And you, you know, you're just, you have to dissociate the, what you're seeing from what you're hearing. Um, and we did a, our test to be like, we got, we got to a certain point and we're like, we think it, it doesn't seem like enough. It's not enough. Like it, there needs to be more reverb. And we're like, well, because it's opportunity, let's just go listen. We can just drive 10 minutes and go to the other campus and see what does the actual place sound like, which was, I don't think we'll ever get to do. Yeah. 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 And, right. So, so Matt Collins, our regional manager out Northwest, who's a trumpet yeah. player, we're, we're going to see videos in a minute of him playing, right? We would do the, he would play trumpet. We would all listen. And we had the rental car outside the loading dock, yeah. with, like the doors open and the engine running so that yeah. we could, we could, we could think real hard about what it sounds like and go run and get in the car, drive across yeah. campus while trying to remember what it sounds like and run yeah. into the back door of Bing concert hall and play it again to compare and make some yeah. mental notes, go back and adjust Bing. But it was all subjective. Yeah. There was no measuring involved. Right. Yeah, not in this process. I mean, I, I know there's tons of software out there that could do it. Um, but for this process, it was like, yeah, what, I mean, what does your brain think that this is going to be like? Again, we're talking about psychoacoustics at this point. We can make it sound, I mean, the math's there. You guys, they, you, they measured the hull. That's the hull for sure. Uh, just how much of the hull do we want in this room? Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, do we, do, nobody talked to each other while we're trying to remember and run over and hit the other side. And it was funny because like that little trumpet solo was perfect because you just need one source that's in the room. What does it sound like here? What does it sound like there? Mm -hmm. And we found out we went too far. We, the first time we went into Bing, we're like, because we had been in Dink for a day or two at that point, making tweaking and making the sound system like not feedback and all sorts of fun basic stuff and tuning it and getting the sound system up and running. And then we're like, oh, we're like way too far. We, we went way off of the too far. We have to dial it back to if we actually want to make it sound like Bing. Yeah, right. So fun, Bing fun Concert concept. Hall has a 2.6 second RT, which isn't short. Yeah. And in Dinkelspiel, we were able to do the same emulation with the same 2.6 second RT, but way louder than the real acoustics in Bing. Yeah. And we just didn't even notice, right? That was kind of one of the yeah. benefits of using an inline technology like the convolution reverb it allows you to get long RT times and a very loud effect, even yeah. if by accident. Yeah, the, the the being louder the point. Yeah, I've I've explained this wrong a couple times. That like it's not like we we magically got more RT or we got more delay. It's just like it was more present because it, this sounds literally coming from right like two feet behind you if you're in a certain spot. So we're just like, oh, we just need the level to come down. Like everything else is fine. It sounds like Bing. It's just a little too much like Bing. <laughs> and and to me that's amazing. Suspended microphones that are you know way above the audience hung from the ceiling and coming out of these speakers that are pointing in towards the microphones. And yeah. we were able to get what, six, eight dB more yeah. effect than we wanted I know. without a feedback issue. Exactly. And that was huge. That was amazing. I mean, we, I, the processing that we went on that did on that was like, pretty minimal to be to be honest. I mean, we did a lot of EQing at the amps and in soundscape, but like just having that ability, you're like, oh, we can go louder if we want, but that's not, if we're gonna be true to what Bing is, is we don't need to. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, in this case, we wanted to be true. And so in fact, uh, if Selena's ready, why don't we listen to two videos of Matt Collins playing the trumpet, uh, one in um, the acoustic hall, Bing concert hall, and the other in Dinkelspiel with soundscape. And again, these are iPhone recordings. They're not exactly, you know, reference yeah. quality. But I think it's still really cool just to hear it happening. Yeah. We should have like turned it off at the last moment. We'd be like, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, we do that um, in the trade show demos. We have it running when we do the introduction and then we turn it off and people are like, oh crap, it was on the whole time. I didn't even notice. Yeah. And I mean, 
as if after all of these systems and I think in virtual hosting in general, but especially these, like that's the best way for if you're ever showing anybody is don't show them with it off, like definitely have it on and it shouldn't be a big deal. I ideally you should just walk in. You're like, Oh, it sounds good. What, what, what did you just spend a million dollars on? You're like, then you turn it off and you're like, Oh, that's no. what I just spent a million dollars on, you know, or whatever your, your budget, obviously it wasn't a million, but like, um, yeah, fool them again when they don't even know yeah. what's happening. You know, you did it right. Yeah, and I mean, I think to the last comment I just saw there is their optimal RT. I don't think you guys have one, but we definitely in Dink we definitely did put soundproofing around. So we, that was a big a big thing. We, you know, we didn't. My big push as a person that had been in the space was I didn't want it dead if it was off. Like I didn't want it to be an anechoic chamber. Not that it, we could have. It would take a, a lot of soundproofing to do that. So we wanted to have some acoustic, but we just we did need it to deaden some of the reflections in there that were like undesirable. Yeah. Um, I think right. we because in in Dinkelspiel it was primarily an issue of early reflections because there's yeah. so much close surfaces, especially overhead. The walls are pretty low, and those yeah. early reflections were really overpowering. So that was yeah. really the focal point of of the absorption you put up, right? Yeah, because I think the the study that we had done at one point, I think the reflection the RT of Dink was around like one point six uh so it wasn't super high and it wasn't it wasn't zero it wasn't one either but like i think at the end of it we're probably closer to like a jazz club um kind of vibe where it's like there's there's soundproofing but you can still have a conversation across the stage and mm -hmm. hear each other yeah and, and more to ryan's question here right you know is there an optimal rt range and the answer is no there is no optimal rt range for the room acoustically uh soundscape is an additive technology so, right, you will be adding soundscape onto whatever is happening acoustically in your environment. Um, but ultimately, it depends on your application. Um, we have very short RT times available in the venue library. If you're outdoors or in a very dead space and you just want to add a little bit of life. And in that point, it wouldn't make sense to add that into a room that already has a little bit of acoustic life. Um, but on the other hand, we have cathedrals that go up to 5.6 seconds. So you can add that into just about anything. And, you know, anything that's not a cathedral is going to be a good environment to add 5.6 uh, seconds of RT time, as long as there aren't really predominant early reflections or really predominant long reverb tail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise, you know, it's just like PAs in general, the deader, the better. That's what yeah. I think. And I think one of the goals is we're going to get I want to get an RT back of like, what did we do to that room? Because at a certain point, we we kind of th were throwing soundproofing at it because we had had a couple of acousticians look at it, like, what do you need? And we had some suggestions. So we were taking them in phases. I apparently love phases. So we like did some of it and then we did another part and then we tuned it. And I think even a little bit more got added. And then when I went back, I was like, oh, okay, okay. You know, it didn't actually make a huge difference to the soundscape thing, but you hear a difference in the room. Uh, which mm -hmm. was an interesting concept. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so here's a question from Fung. Uh, does mixing a sound, does mixing sound sources directly on soundscape require additional reverb delay, like a stereo system? So, would you find yourself using, um, you know, like an onboard effect or like a stereo reverb, that type of stuff? Um, I haven't I, because it. I feel like I don't need to because I feel like for me personally in some of the use cases, you know, obviously not 100%, but like I was using those to get the reverb back into the PA, you know, like get the room, make it sound like it's in the room. So you're just trying to trick the PA, add warmth back into your sound with your reverb. So it's like, if Soundscape's doing all of that, no, I don't I don't need to. Um, a few cases we have, which we've, we've done it for an, a particular effect, like a plate or, or something that's actually doing that. And right, like gated verb on your snare drum it, or that. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. obviously you're not going to replace that with soundscape. Uh, but for those room reverbs, I've just gone without. I have mixed and it sounds great because mm -hmm. in that sense, you're it's a different mindset. I'm like, I'm not mixing for the reverb. I'm not mixing. I'm just making more sound in the room. So it sounds as, as transparent as possible. And you're hearing the performance. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I find myself doing that, too. You know, I'm. In soundscape, I'm using it like reverb on an aux. I don't want the kick drum to go to it, but I do want the snare to go to it. I do want the toms yeah. to go to it, but I don't want the bass guitar to go to it. And personally, I've always wrestled with digital reverbs. 
and I have all of my tricks for stacking reverbs on top of each other and to try to make it feel more natural. And I just personally yeah. don't need to go back. Yeah. I mean, there's a question earlier. I lost it on would I go back, I think, um, to a traditional soundscape, a system that I've done so many. Um, and it's a little jarring at first. I don't know if you 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 mix on some that aren't soundscape as well, but like you're like, oh, I just want to do, I just want to add some room to this thing. And you're like, oh right, that was a little bit longer process than I remember. Or you know, right, it's, it, right. It's just, Adding reverb to a stereo PA is actually a longer process now. Yeah, and you're like, oh, I have to do all these other steps. I, obviously, as engineers, you're everyone's flexible and you can make it happen. And the, you know, I'm not saying the technology of the last 40 years has been the worst, but um, it's a lot easier to walk into sound systems, yeah, soundscape system that I know I'm like, oh, I can just send that thing to an op sound object, put it right there and it's done. Like most of my mixing yeah. is done beyond level. Personally, um, as an engineer, I really like a huge canvas. I like to mix with a ton of space. And yeah. when I get back on a stereo rig, even if it's like a KSL rig or something super cool, I find myself wanting to like hard pan and make stuff really big and wide. And I have to remind myself, yeah. this doesn't work for everybody in the audience on a stereo rig. I can't yeah. do this. I was like, I can on a soundscape system, right? Yeah, similarly. So like we had just finished in 2019, we had just finished Dink. Um, and I went, I came here to Sun Valley and I, that same concert, the Mahler concert, I was mixing because we have all the mics on stage. We're micing the full orchestra and everyone. And I found myself like, oh, I'm going to pan all the violins to the left and like delay back the, the choir a little bit. And it, you know, it works to a certain extent, but you're right. It doesn't work for everyone. So you can't be as extreme or you just have to be very cautious in what you're doing. So it's not as like, I can't just trust the sound system to do what I want it to do and just do it versus these that you, you have to go check around and make sure you're not blocking out some of the seats or making a complete mud pile for the person in the back as you as mm -hmm. as you have and people have been doing for a while mm -hmm. um but yeah it is it is hard <laughs> it's not the easiest thing but yeah yeah it's weird going back mm -hmm. um all right so so what do you say we put out a final call for some questions or comments see who else out there has got some and just as a reminder if you're watching this later and you have a question email support at dbaudio.com and we're happy to answer your questions. Um, and I just want to give a shout out, Holger, thank you, my friend. Uh, he confirmed TI-501, and I'm told he put a link in the chat. Uh, if you don't find that, just go to dbaudio.com and search for TI-501 in the download section. This is the technical information document about Soundscape. It talks about NSYNC, and space, DS-100, external control like tracking systems and QLab, all of that kind of stuff. That's a great place to start for some um, good casual technical reading. Yeah, I'm yeah. still I still read that manual every once in a while. We were in here in Sun Valley doing this system. I like would go back and check things be like, Am I, is that really how I think it works? Oh, yeah. OK, you know, it's a, it's a right. useful manual. Yep, absolutely. Um, all right, so no questions coming in yet. We'll give it an extra minute here. You want to talk about what you're doing at the Voxel as we kind of wrap up here? Yeah, um, so like I said, Voxel, brand new space. We're gonna be a black box theater. Um, so we have our one main space down down below and we're building our soundscape system there. It, it wasn't like a, a big thing. We brought it in, uh, figure 53 had our, our DS100 to make sure the integration worked. Uh, so we have that one out there. Um, That's right. Figure 53 had like one of the first DS100s not in Germany because they yeah. were working on the integration with the software, right? Yeah, yeah. So got to use that and put it in the room. Um, and we're just, we're, my hope is that it becomes a, a, such a flexible space that, you know, we either have a ring of speakers around the room and based on the show, you're just like, oh, sounds coming out of that wall or this wall or that wall. Um, part of the infrastructure we're putting in is, is to be able to reconfigure where the speakers go. So you can rehang the speakers, work for your show and just replot it in soundscape. And then you have a brand new soundscape set up. Um, so it, I'm really hoping it becomes like a, a most versatile of, of soundscape systems because it is modular in that sense. Right, um, because we, we have a couple of projects that you and me are looking at right now where it's kind of a black box setup. And the mm -hmm. idea of making an initial investment into a 360 soundscape system will save money over time because you can electronically reconfigure the system instead of having to rehang speakers when man lifts yeah. and bring crew in, right? 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, for, like if you have speakers in the 360 and you just have a one-off show, you're like, oh, for, they're coming in for four hours and doing something. Sound comes up, but the audience is facing this way. All right, cool. All the sounds coming out of that that wall over there. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't have to worry about your speaker system and having, but also having flexible enough where I have that two month install theatrical show that wants to use them differently. And like, okay, that's fine. Also, re you can rehang the speakers if you want to, but having that yeah, flexibility. Because anybody that knows how to use a ray calc can rehang the speakers and redeploy soundscape quickly. Yeah. But having the ability to not have to is going to be, it would be, is right. huge. Um, I mean, we've seen some case studies like sporting arenas where they have, you know, tours come in and set up a guest stage and they need to time align the house system to that guest stage. So they use a single sound object that gets the mono feed from that guest production and they just move the sound object along the field until it's lined up with where their stage is set up for that that particular day's concert. And now their whole house rig is just time aligned to that stage. They're only using one of the 64 sound objects. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what we did it uh, for uh, Sun Valley here. That's our, that's our guest system. You know, where, where's your one sound object? Just put it there. And at that point, we just have a really clean, easy to use delay matrix system. Like that's all it's doing. Mm -hmm. uh, let's uh, see here. Uh, Bill Brooks asked a question. Uh, what do you do at figure 53? And are there any new DS100 integration features in the pipeline? Oh boy. So pray there, buddy. Clear. I, I have to be very transparent. I am not an employee of Figure Fifty Three. I'm an employee of the Voxel Theater LLC. Um, so I can't. I do not speak with the software engineer team. I just speak for the venue. Um, but there's some cool stuff coming from Figure Fifty Three. I don't know if anything's um, DS100 specific. Uh, to be clear, uh, so I I just need to be very transparent with who I work for. Technically, <laughs> good. I like it. Um, here's another question. Uh, Fung says, I'm worried when I can't use group or matrix when mixing sound sources on a soundscape system, right? Uh, this idea that your individual instruments or maybe a group of instruments is being sent to a sound object, there's no more master bus. This is, yeah. this is a hard thing for people to get used to at first, right? It's, it's hard for, I think, almost everyone trans transitioning. And it is definitely, uh, it is, that's part of wrapping your head around the whole different way of mixing you know i'm now yeah i had 32 sound up 32 band inputs before but you know i could always bring down that fader or change globally on one thing um our quick our main go-to is a a dca you can still have all those sound objects going to where they're supposed to go in in space and you have your dca you can still mute them and bring them down Right, right. So, um, we, so we actually reassign the master fader to be a DCA control instead of a stereo bus. That way you still have yeah. a handle for your mix. Yeah. And depending on your application, like, you know, the drums per se, maybe you still, we've talked about this before, maybe you still do group all that to one sound object. So then that's your one sound object in space. And it's just coming from that where the drums are, because that's eight, 10 inputs, depending on what you're doing, that are basically kind of the same place so if that's better for you that's fine but you don't have to uh, mm -hmm. or maybe that's so you, you have your options there um but yeah it, it is part of the getting your head around object-based mixing versus stereo left right or just get how figuring out your workflow then how you're gonna do those certain things that work best for you yeah and and you have to get used to not having like a mastery queue in your console and for yeah. that solution, we just have a master global EQ and R1, which is how mm -hmm. a lot of people are running their traditional PAs anyways. Um, and it's great because you can still do your system EQ in the amplifiers, and you can have separate EQs in the processor so that when the guest engineer shows up, you still hand them a flat EQ for them to do their subjective thing that the show needs without having to even see or be aware of what you've done for your tuning. Yeah. And and they, it can still be compartmentalized because you've got 32 bands of EQ on the amp. You have 32 bands of EQ, uh, 16 bands of EQ on each input to the DS100 and eight bands of EQ on each output of the DS100 or the other way around. doesn't matter. More EQ yeah. than you need. Way more. And you can, I think we, correct me if I'm wrong, we had it set up like we had our front, like our pergola lines. We have an EQ for a whole group, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, it. it in, in the end, it's doing the same EQ to a, a bunch of different outputs, but 
if you need to do that kind of thing, you can just do that all in R1. So I think in that sense, it takes some of that EQ you're doing at your console and puts it in R1. Um, but if you're and not going to be actively in soundscape, you're going to have your R1 machine there with your console. They're not going to, they're going to be in the same space anyways. Yeah. So mm -hmm. about the same yeah. reach time. Well, and that comes back to Bill's comment earlier. He, he imagines I used more EQ than I'm used to not using DMB speakers. Uh, I think we'd both agree that that was true in that case. Yeah, I think or at Dinker at Sun Valley. At Sun Valley, because they weren't DMB speakers, but we're used to having the processing and the speaker just so aware of each other yeah. that the end result that comes out of the speaker is just exactly fine the way it is, plus some subjective changes. And yeah, we, we actually had to bust out the smart rig on that one. Yeah. Yeah, we did. Because I mean, like you said, it eventually hope there'll be DMB speakers. But yeah, for this for this thing, it, it, the, what, D, what the DS100 is expecting is not there. Um, mm -hmm. And those EAWs leave much to be desired in, in terms of definitely low ends and, re and rear um sound off the back so yeah <laughs> pulled out the smart rig for a little bit there while i was doing some networking all right so so how about this um we're talking about console workflow we're talking about busing we're talking about processing tell me how would you compare the amount of processing you're doing in the mixer when doing a traditional pa versus doing a soundscape pa do you see a difference there uh yeah definitely i think i you basically offload a lot of what you're doing because i mean i know for our symphony shows we're running three or four reverbs you're doing a bunch of matrixing and grouping and then that's getting sent out you know our old stuff was getting sent to a constellation uh galileo which then has all of its reverb and processing so i i think it's a lot less i'm doing you know now it's i do a little bit on the channel you know i got the those violins i want to sound um and then or jazz trumpet we did jazz stuff at stanford and they'll let the ds100 do, do the rest so i think you're doing a lot less at the console and doing a lot more in R, r1 personally mm -hmm. yeah i found personally you know because i mix a lot of the demo content that we hear at soundscape demos and usually i start in the headphones around my near field monitors working on a stereo pa just get it roughed in and then I plug it in a soundscape and play it back and go, what was I doing? My mix is terrible. Yeah. And so I turn off all of my channel processing, all those EQs and compressors and all of that stuff. And the mm -hmm. mix just comes back to life. And I have to remember this every time that yeah. so much of what we do as a mix engineer is compensating for the negative effects of a stereo bus. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're like in a stereo bus, you're trying to create the space in the mix that just comes naturally out of the soundscape. So, yeah, I mean, I found myself like, I'll get my EQ and I'll touch it. You know, you get your gain, your EQ, you'll touch it. And you get your compressing just so you don't break anything. But you're not Safety trying to do Safety compressor, anything. I call it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Depending on, you know, especially for the singers or whatever. Um, but I'm not, I'm not working as hard, which is kind of nice. You know, there's a lot of work somewhere else being done, but mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be on site, on show or what in your one hour sound check or whatever you have. Right, right. Uh, so another question here, uh, do you need to tune the soundscape speaker system, each speaker during installation? What do you think, Kevin? No, which is fantastic. Um, like we mentioned before, if you just uh, tell a ray calc where it needs to be, where your speaker is, that's the most important thing. Um, you don't need to tune each speaker. Uh, I mean, like we mentioned before, Nick did some tuning for the non TNB speakers. Um, but that's the beauty of it. It's it's taking care of a lot of that. I mean, I wouldn't say don't listen to it. Don't we make sure that things are coming out of the right spot. You know, it's the first the first thing make sure all your your Dante matrixes are correct. And your surrounds are actually coming out of a surround speaker. Trust uh, but verify as Jamie Anderson would say. Yeah, yeah. It's not an old Nixon thing. Well, uh, Reagan, I believe yeah. Reagan. Uh, um, <laughs> But yeah, you don't need to sit there and, and smart or tune each speaker because at mm -hmm. some point you're all these things are doing the same, but array calc telling them what to do differently. I mean, I'm gonna toot my own horn here, but you know, when you got DMB speakers, you got a well-behaved loudspeaker with good off-axis uh, dispersion control. You've got uh, perfectly coupled processing in the mixer, um, and and. Uh, and then uh, you know, all speakers are voiced to match together out of the box. They're level matched, bada bing, bada boom. Yeah. 
I mean, that's why I'm super excited. Like we had amazing results here in Sun Valley with these old speakers. And I'm just like, imagine what it'll be with some new, like some new speakers, like that transparency that we've been looking for and the flow between all the pergola lines. It's just going to be amazing mm -hmm. once you get some good speakers in there too. Yeah. Can't wait. Well, um, Kevin, uh, you got to get back to work. You're out at Sun Valley. You're there because you're working, right? Yeah. It's our first day here. Got to do some stuff. Um, console manufacturers adopt DCA. I, I'm just reading some of the comments too. Um, yeah. I mean, like I said, I think at the beginning, my biggest takeaway from Soundscape has been the Swiss Army knife effect of I can do throw it at so many projects now and now have the, the confidence that it'll do it. You know, I can make it work with whatever I, I have. So it doesn't. I had the, the spectrum of Dink where I got to play place everything where I wanted it to be, and then Sun Valley where some I'm limited, and Boxel where we're still growing, and it's um, you know, it just keeps working. It works where, how I want it to and how I, I expect it to, which is great. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Hey, next time I come out there, will you take me whitewater rafting? Yeah. Oh yeah. Don't worry. There's no. <laughs> yeah. We'll go. We'll go for hours. It'll be fun. All right. Uh, so, uh, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, you just saw the ticker across the bottom. Email support at dbaudio.com if you have any questions or comments. We're here. It's literally our job. Um, and head to dbsoundscape.com for more information. Uh, thanks for joining us. It's been so much fun. Uh, and we're so excited here in the U.S. to be getting back to work. Fingers crossed everything goes good this season, right? Yeah. Hopefully, I hope everyone has safe travels and safe gigging as it goes out as the fall comes. So take care, everyone. There you go. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care.